Okay. Thank you for being there. Thank you for the invitation. Um, this is based on joint work with uh, Jean Thibault at Toulouse. Uh, we're both economists. We've done a fair amount of work in behavioral economics. So the behavioral part means trying to take seriously lessons and insights from psychology, both cognitive, social, and other, and incorporate them into how we think about individuals and then groups, markets, organizations. And the economics part means uh, retaining the methodological tools of formal modeling, emphasis on equilibrium, where everybody's actions are considered together, and, uh, and the possibility of doing welfare analysis and policy analysis. Topics. This one is, uh, I called it Laws and Norms because it's the title of the last paper in the series that we wrote. But it's more about the interaction of formal incentives, the type that economists usually focus on, and informal incentives, the type that psychologists and sociologists usually focus on, and so on. In the first category, we have rewards, prices, contracts, the law. In the second, we have norms, or even internalized norms, self esteem, identity, self image and intrinsic motivation. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to base the talk on, on a bunch of papers. First, uh, the, I'll try to give you a very simplified or you know non-formal view of the type of model that we've been working on. This is based on these three papers that, uh, that we wrote and in which you'll recognize hopefully a lot of uh, familiar uh, ideas from psychology. And then I'll go to some other people's work uh, for the uh, peer test and application, one which will be done in the lab, uh, including by some we may know, and another one which will be done in the field, actually with a huge data set uh, done in China. Okay? And those both will hopefully demonstrate how the, you know, such a model can allow us to go beyond basic insights and derive further implications. Okay, so the model is going to, or the theory is going to have uh, three basic motives uh, for, it's going to focus on pro-social behavior or you know, socially desirable behaviors or antisocial, uh, although we, have also, we can also deal with other types of behavior, but this is going to have emphasis here. And uh, there are going to be basically three motives, uh, one which is uh, altruistic, public-spirited, so true intrinsic uh, motivation to do good. The second one is you know, self-interest, there's incentives, there's a law. And the third one is uh, attributional, so it's looking good to others, or looking good to yourself, or keeping your self-esteem, and so on. And what we're going to focus is the interaction that, you know, in most situations, as was mentioned earlier, uh, they are all present, and they interact, and if you change one, it changes the others. And in particular, it changes the others through informational uh, channels, or through the inferences that people draw from behavior. Um, <clears throat> So in particular, if we choose incentives or the visibility or the salience of a good or bad behavior, that's going to change what people understand uh, about you know, why, why others are doing it. And therefore, the whole equilibrium is going to shift, and there's going to be both direct and indirect effect of the policy. So it's going to be a very simple model, but it's bringing together and necessarily simplifying each building block, a lot of building blocks to see how they relate to each other, and uh, hopefully, uh, have you know, be able to say things like when should we expect crowding out or crowding in? Uh, when should we expect multiple social norms, some new implications, welfare analysis? If people interact through norms and you also give them incentives, how should the incentives, whether it's a contract or the law, you know, be designed to, to leverage the norm and so on? And then there's other topics that we talked about which we don't Okay, so uh, I'm going to now just give you a little. Uh, um, idea of the building blocks of the model, then I'll stress two of the main implications, and then we'll see, um, we'll see uh, some tests. Okay, so let's think about uh, people <coughs> choose an action, and I could take it to be a, a I'm going to take it to be a pro-social action, and I'm going to call it, you know, participation, but also crowd compliance, and it's going to be known as A, A for altruism. I could have chosen an anti-social uh, it may be a you know zero one giving blood or having blood, or it could be how much you contribute, how much you have others. 
In any case, it has a cost, a personal cost, in terms of time, resources, and so on. Then what do you get for it? You get uh, possibly some incentive. This is what economists will focus upon. Let's say a monetary incentive. It doesn't have to be of five dollars per unit of A. Okay? Or equivalently, if you don't, the less of A you do, the more you get taxed or fined at a rate of five dollars per unit. Um, so that's going to be one of the motivations. But um, uh, as you can see here, we're going to uh, start first with both the intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. So if I do a level amount of A of good stuff, for example, being green, environmentally uh, you know, correct, etc., I'm going to be rewarded at some rate, maybe there's a subsidy or maybe there's a tax on being brown. Uh, y, and then I value money at some rate, V sub Y, and that's my marginal utility of money. Sometimes I call it greed, or it could also be need. Presumably the poor have a higher marginal value, uh, marginal value of money. Then there's the intrinsic part. I just like, or maybe dislike, to do the right thing, and that is measured by VA. That's my intrinsic motivation. Think of it as joy of giving, joy of helping, etc. And then there's the cost. Okay. So that, those are the basic motivations. Now the next step is uh, that how good a person is, or how greedy a person is, or needy is not directly observable. We have to infer it. We have to extract intent. Or types from their behavior, and of course people have uh, incentives to uh, look good uh, in many situations. So now we're going to have the second part, which is the image or the reputational concern. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in many cases, as I said, you want people to think you have a high VA, that you're a pro-social type, uh, a nice person, and maybe not such a greedy, needy person, although there are cases in which you might want that as well. And similarly, this, everything I say for social perception also goes for uh, self-perception, uh, where people look at their own actions, they have imperfect recall of why they did something at a given point in time, and they attribute motives to themselves, just like other attribute motives. Okay, so we're going to add to people's basic motivation a concern for appearing pro-social times uh, you know, how pro-social you appear in light of your behavior, and maybe a concern for about appearing greedy times uh, you know, how greedy you appear. So formally, uh, people look at what I did, my action A, they may be aware that there was an incentive Y, or at least they have beliefs about that, and that they form posterior expectations of how good a person I am, my, my altruism, let's say, or my, close, my intrinsic motivation, and this is how, my, how much I care about their view of me. I may care just because I like to be esteemed, or I may care because if they don't esteem me, they'll come and beat me up and slash my calories. Okay? And similarly here for how much I care about being perceived as greedy or needy and the inferences that people form. Okay, so M is for image, E is for expectation. Uh, people could differ just as well, just as they differ in intrinsic motivation and value of extrinsic incentive, they could differ in how much they care about being perceived or social and how much they care about being perceived greedy. There can be a lot of heterogeneity across people in this model. Okay, so just to summarize, we have these three different motives represented by the three different icons. And the individual does what you know, they do in economics, which is try to seek to maximize or you know, uh, go in the direction of the maximizing the sum of these things, which is represented here. So we have intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation times extrinsic incentive, the cost, and then the reputational or self-image motivation, which may have one dimension or two dimensions. And finally, if this is indeed an activity that's good for the social good, you know, I benefit from the total amount of cleanliness or donation or compliance of others. Uh, that's big A. That's the total amount. Now, uh, so what do you do? How do you choose how to uh, behave? You look at the cost of the action, uh, and you look at the benefits. So the cost, the marginal cost, if I do a little bit more pain, this is how painful and how much it costs me. And this is what I get. I get some intrinsic satisfaction, V A, which I know. I get Y dollars, which I value at V sub Y each. And I get some reputational return uh, for doing A, given that, um, given that the incentive is one. 
And we can see here, you know, the familiar attribution problem in psychology, or what we call it in economics, the single extraction problem. If you're looking at a person who's doing A, and you have some idea of how costly it is, how much they're contributing, or helping, you're trying to infer their in true intrinsic motivation, because that's what's going to matter in the future when you interact with that again, for example. But what you observe is only the sum of these three terms. In particular, this term here is a source of noise. If people vary both, if there's variance both in this and in that, in trying to infer an individual's characteristic here, this is a source of noise, and it's a bigger source of noise the higher is the incentive. Okay? Similarly, if people differ a lot in how much they value reputation, this is another source of noise that prevents you from making clean inferences about that. Okay? So this is how you can get kind of over justification of monetary rewards, or in this term, an over just similar thing of publicity. If you give too much publicity to incentivize people, then they start thinking everybody's behaving well because of publicity. So you know, formally, the, the, again, this is the same thing, equating the, the cost plus the sum of the three marginal motivations. And so the result that we get is the following. Uh, here, which is illustrated by this graph. So here's the incentive, the thing that you know the planner or the economist would manipulate, and this is aggregate supply of the good behavior, or what you would call you know, total com average compliance. Now, if there are no image concerns, so this this uh, you know so you, you, your people are not trying to signal, then we have a nice linear increasing relationship. In fact, uh, uh, when between how much you incentivize people and how they behave. Now, as image starts becoming important, they behave better, okay? because they have one more motivation to behave better. So the total compliance goes up. But at the same time as it goes up, uh, you know, it becomes uh, less sensitive uh, or perversely sensitive to Y. As you blow up Y, you're increasing this, but you're reducing that. So you can see that as the curve moves up, it becomes flatter. There's less of response incentives. And there can even be a range where you get you know, net crawling out, that is, the more you reward, the less, um, the less of the behavior you get. Okay? Um, so in terms of, uh, so that's the, you know, let's think of it in terms, of, so I'm focusing here on the crowding out case, either complete crowding out or, you know, reduction in the power of incentives, but the model can also, you know, also have predictions of when you should get crowding in, and I'll come to that later. Let's think of it in terms of, imp of Testable implications. People contribute more when they're observed by others. So average compliance goes up when you know I scale up the image motivation by telling people what you do. That's, that's kind of like the main effect. But this should attenuate when people know that you're rewarded. So the cross effect or second derivative effect. Equivalently, the effective deficit incentive is smaller or even could be reversed when both the contribution and the reward are observed. So this is the effectiveness of the incentive. It's decreasing. Okay, so here's a simple test of, of, of the model uh, by Ariely, Rafa, and Meyer. Um, people or subjects, so this is a kind of a standard, I would say almost psychology, psychology type experiments. A population is, uh, you know, students. A uh, sample is, uh, I think it's uh, 161 subjects. Okay, so people are going to do a task that is boring. So we're, we're kind of killing the intrinsic motivation out of you know, interest in the task. You have to press keys to earn money uh, according to a schedule. And then the money goes to a charity, which has been assigned randomly. And the design is a two by two by two. The charity can either be a good one or a bad one in the context of the experiments. The good one is the American Red Cross, but the bad one, quote unquote, is the National Rifle Association, or the less than this is the MIT. You need it in Texas, maybe. <laughs> Um, so, you know, presumably uh, uh, signaling or reputation motivations are going to matter much more here and might even be negative there. Incentives, you either get paid for each click just as much as uh, goes to the charity or not. And finally, there's a private versus public condition. Either it's anonymous, what you did and what you earned and who the money went to, or at the end you must tell all the other participants which charity you were assigned to how much you earn for it, and how much you earn for yourself, and if you earn for yourself. And so we're going to test the prediction of, uh, of the model, and in particular this negative cross derivative, which you can see 
uh, very simply here. So let's think first about uh, the case where behavior is private. So uh, only economic incentives matter. So we see, first of all, that even without incentives, people do some of it. So there is some intrinsic motivation. Even when there is no image motivation, it would be self-image. And when you increase the incentive, people do more. That's the standard effect of incentives. When you make things public, the first prediction is that people will do more uh, you know, in the unrewarded. So you see that as well. So now they have both the intrinsic motivation and the reputational motivation. And however, when you increase the incentive, now you're killing the reputational motivation. And you get very clearly this cross effect. It actually you know, uh, it, it, it falls and it gets uh, basically you're, you're better off not offering the incentive. Okay. You can also look at the effect of private the bad charities for the, the National Rifle Association. You can see, first of all, with private condition, you know, people do much less of it. They do some of it because there are some gun enthusiasts. They respond very well to incentives. Uh, making the behavior public doesn't give you much leverage. You don't get credit for it, and you don't get blamed for it either. It's pretty fun. Okay. So um, let me now talk about uh, social norms, um, honor and stigma. So we understand, you know, the usual definition of norms is that you know the more people do something, uh, the more usually you are inclined to do it. Uh, and there are many examples, many uh, experiments, and so on. Uh, it's often explained or modeled, at least economics, as some general norm of reciprocity. If people in society are good, then I will be good. There may be some of that, but there's also evidence that it's not about that, just about that. Uh, and then in other situations, people try to distinguish themselves from the, from the rest, okay? And they will be rewarded for that. So here is an organ donation identity. And so it's not always the case that you follow the problem. Sometimes you want to stand up. So in fact, we want to understand where social norms come from, or at least have one channel that you know, we can <coughs> explore then, empirically. Uh, and here, they're going to come from image or self-image motivations, what I call the interplay of honor and stigma. And then we want to understand when is it that the fact that other contribute or comply more is going to lead me to comply more or to comply less. And as a result, also, you know, what are the effects of incentives? But if we induce people to apply more to full incentive, you know, what, what's the second round of that? What's the effect? Okay, so I'm going to draw a little picture and uh, and try to uh, illustrate, you know, how when again when you change, let's say, the direct intrinsic extrinsic motivation, the image motivation, the R and the stigma change in ways that are in general ambiguous, but about which the model can still make predictions. Okay, so. Here now people are just, so for simplicity, it's now just a yes-no decision uh, as opposed to how much I contribute or comply. And I'm going to have people differ only in one dimension, which is an altruism or intrinsic motivation or you know, company spirit, whatever, uh, which again is something that is privately known and people try to say. So at any level of incentive, you know, there's going to be a cutoff. The ones who participate or comply, but the rules going to be Above, and the ones who abstain are going to be below. So if I see somebody who participates, I don't know what their value is, but I know that on average it's the truncated, the average of the truncated distribution here. And if I see somebody who abstain, I don't know how bad they are, but I know that on average they have this distribution. Uh, <clears throat> so if uh, so, now what is the incentive to participate rather than abstain? You will get your intrinsic motivation. You can get intrinsic. Board, and then, you, instead of being assigned uh, a stigma, maybe the mean uh, type or the mean motivation of this group, you'll be assigned the mean motivation of that group. And so this is your net gain, and this is how much you're concerned about the you know, image or self-image. And so now let's think about, so that's the same model as before. Now let's think about increasing uh, compliance by you know, punishing people if they don't or rewarding them if they do. So we're going to move the cutoff in this direction. So you know nothing happens here, although you know it could in other contexts it could be. Uh, we know what happens there, what happens here? Well clearly participating is now less of a distinguished activity because you know all these people do it who are not so great. And on the other hand, not participating is even worse than before. It's really the bottom of the barrel that doesn't that 
doesn't. So R goes down, stigma goes up, and so in general, the difference between the two is ambiguous. It could be that uh, you, know, you get crowding out or crowding in, and we'd like to know when. So <clears throat> now, um, uh, here's a, a simple intuition. Suppose that the, that the distribution of these uh, intrinsic motivations looks like this, namely, uh, most people are pretty good, and then there's a few bad apples, okay? And so, um, a few bad apples. You can see them when, I'm, or you should, it should be intuitive that when I change the, when I change the cutoff by changing the incentive, it doesn't make much difference to how you think of a person here, but it makes a lot of difference to how you think of a person there. Conversely, if most people are mediocre, or, and a few people are exceptional, you know, M plus, the honor is much more sensitive to change in participation. So, um, formally, uh, it means that if my distribution is mostly increasing, then the reputational value is decreasing in the number of people who participate, vice versa, decreasing. And the general case is where we have a nice cell-shaped uh, distribution of types or motives, in which case the reputational value is inverse of uh, shaped So this leads directly to how you should optimally set incentives. Here is, um, for example, the cost of the behavior, which is going to you know, cost fewer people to do it, or here is the general mean altruism in society that's going to cause more people to do it. Now, uh, as so what I've just shown is that the, the value of reputation is maximal at the ends and minimal in the middle. At this end, you have high stigma if you don't do the behavior when most people do it, and for example, because it has more cost. So uh, you don't need much incentive. At that uh, end, uh, this is something that's very costly, think of donating a kidney to a stranger. Uh, few people do it, it's very costly, so you get a lot of honor to reward you. Again, you don't need much uh, incentive. So where you should get incentives is in this middle region where inferences are blurry and where um, uh, reputational motives are weak. And so formally, optimal incentives should be you know, the, the value to society of your contribution or your compliance minus what you're getting paid in reputation by behaving well rather than bad. Okay, so now let me think of uh, testable implications and take it to China. How much? Zero. Oh, okay. I think one minute. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so when a socially approved behavior is sufficiently prevalent, stigma avoidance rather than honor seeking will be the dominant concern, and we should get prodding in. That's the prediction. Conversely, when it's sufficiently clear, kidney donation, heroism, et cetera, uh, uh, stick, um, suicide bombing, we were talking about that a little bit yesterday, uh, you know, it's honor seeking that's the dominant uh, concern, and we should get crowding out. More generally, the more prevalent the socially approved behavior, the larger the effect of formal incentives. So again, we get a cross effect that you know, my propensity to comply, or in response to an increase in incentives should be increasing in the average level of compliance around the UN by reference code. Okay? And, uh, and that, of course, is endogenous, but we can manipulate it either through visibility or through cost. Okay, so let's go to China, uh, go from a small sample to a huge sample, go from the lab to the, to the you know, the very important behaviors in the uh, lives of people, which is what ethnic identity you give to your child. So in China, um, let me skip uh, directly here. Uh, in China, uh, people who are from a mixed, mixed, marriage, mixed marriage can choose the ethnicity of their child. And then in 1980, they int introduced kind of affirmative action benefits for being a minority child. Okay, so now you have you get rewarded for choosing the minority child, but of course, it's, this might be with more or less social approval or disapproval. So in this paper. Uh, they looked at uh, data from the Chinese censuses that looked at these mixed couples, and they looked at, you know, what is the propensity to choose a, a minority ethnicity for your child uh, as a function of benefits and as a function of what people around you are doing in your 
prefecture or in your uh, even small area. Um, so how is the majority? Then there are you know, 55 majority minorities that have these benefits, uh, and you can choose whatever you want. In practice, it's the husband that chooses, maybe not surprisingly. And uh, what we see is that when the man is uh, when the man is a uh, sorry the most interesting case here is when the man is a minority uh, Han and the woman is a minority yeah. and I'll just there's a lot of variation in what people choose this is represented by this graph uh, they have a huge data sample okay and then just what I want to show maybe regression is that what's the probability of choosing a minority child uh, as a function of uh, you know uh, province uh, controls etc prefecture and then post 1980 which is when these benefits came into effect versus whether you are in a prefecture where the fraction of people choosing uh, majority status was higher or lower than uh, x percent and basically whatever threshold you higher is the x, the higher is the coefficient, which says, again, you know, in, um, which is exactly the prediction that where uh, socially approved may be not going to any benefits and you know, maintaining the ethnic identity of the, of, the, of, the, of the father, it's prevalent in sentiments are more efficient and, and vice versa where it's not prevalent. You can do it across different uh, quartile or Deciles of the population as a fraction, you know, as a function of what's the fraction of people in the previous generation who were choosing who were of one ethnicity or the other. And again, you see this kind of increasing uh, response to incentives as a function of prevalence. Okay. Then they have other tests which uh, are also consistent with that. And so they conclude, um, they conclude, you know, that. that there's support for these prediction, and then they also think about, well, one step before, who am I going to marry? If I marry a minority person, then I get this choice. That's obviously going to affect 